taught all those technologies for this and worship for yield. And my farmers were going broke. And it bothered me to no end. Now, this opening of the heart and mind happened. And it happened at the right times. Now my paradigm is this. How to mimic nature. How to love it, to nurture it. How to emulate it. How to emulate it. Not force it. Not control it. And Gabe, my friend, taught me one important, he taught me many things. But one of the things he taught me, once you go to this system, there's one incredible thing you have to have. Two, actually. First one is humility. I had to be humbled and realize I did not know anything. And as far as I continue in this journey, I know nothing. And the second is, Gabe taught me, really got using Gabe, the second one was faith. Faith in the system. It works. It works, ladies and gentlemen. It was speaking to us for years. It says, emulate me. And the farmers, you, raise your hand, farmers, raise your hand, that have been applying soil health practice. Raise your hand. How does it feel to have hope and a future and freedom? Mm. Does it feel good? It feels awesome. Now I have farmers, and I'll say this quickly and I hand it over to Gabe. I had a farmer that came to our school, the class, 71. There was a 38-year-old and a 71-year-old farmer right next to each other. We were teaching and everything, and you could see the 71-year-old got it, and the 38-year-old man did not get it. And they were sitting and heard the same message. It had nothing to do with age. That man went and sold all his equipment, went to cover crops, and John from South Carolina, I saw him again. I said, John, how do you like farming? Now, he goes, Ray, I love it. I have hope now. I am gaining 71 year old and one more thing I'm going to tell you as I teach all over the country Gabe and I get to go everywhere you know the ones that are picking up the quickest the women <laughs> yeah girl <laughs> ecology farming is nurturing guys I nurtured three daughters but it's something when you get in front of that tractor, all nurturing goes out the window. So, Troy, we're going to cost share anything. It would be tranquilizer gun. <laughs> Give it to the mom. Goes, there he goes, there he goes. Now, bring him back into the house. So I'm going to give it to my friend Gabe, and he'll guide you how he went through this, this beautiful journey. This is an amazing journey. Give Gabe a hand, please. Well, thank you. What a pleasure it is to be here today. I, I can't tell you what it means. You know, Ray and I have been going down this path, as have many others, for a long, long time. And there's many times we're on the, on the road, and this is how bad it is. Uh, here, I've pretty much been on the road since last October. Well, really, for the last 15 plus years. But from October through April, we travel a lot. And uh, my wife, one of those rare occasions when I made it home, she met me at the door and she said, do you realize you've spent over three times as many nights with that man as you have with me? Now, the scary part of that whole thing is, you know, after a while, you start looking like your spouse. <laughs> I, I just, I'm like, oh, things got to change. <laughs> but I was asked to come and just share briefly with you the journey that my family and I have been on the past 25 plus years as we've gone down this regenerative agriculture path. And it's a story that's played out over and over again. And I remember one of the first times that I met Grant and Dawn and really had a chance to visit with them, got to sit down and hear their story. And it was a story that was so similar to my own, it just felt like we're kindred spirits, and we are. It happens over and over again. So those of you who don't know me, I didn't grow up on a farmer ranch. I, I really am a first generation farmer. However, I had the good fortune that I fell in love with my 
high school sweetheart and she always told everybody she was going to marry a city boy because she wanted as far from the farm as she could get. Well, now today, 38 years later, she reminds me of that often, that she wanted to move away, but we're on her parents' farm or ranch. And we went to college, got a degree, and her parents asked us, would you come back and take over the ranch? So I learned how to farm, how to ranch from my father-in-law. And I'll never forget certain things my father-in-law said. The man loved to till. He absolutely loved to till. And it was a small grain operation, cow-calf operation, half summer fallow, half crop, grew spring wheat, oats, barley, with synthetic fertilizers, a little bit of pesticides, some fungicides, but he loved to till. He was a German. Till and pick rocks. That's what he liked to do. And I remember every spring we'd go out there and we'd each be in a tractor tilling the fields and he'd said to me, now we're just trying to till in order to dry the soil out so we can see. But it always amazed me because come July, we were on our knees praying for rain. And I'm like, this just doesn't make sense. And then he would tell me, Dave, the more you work the soil, the better it is. And I'm going, well, how can that be? Well, I spent eight years alongside him learning how to farm. And then my wife and I have the good, had the good fortune in 1991 we purchased a part of the ranch from them. And so then I could finally do some things that I'd read about. Because I was book smart, but not practical smart. So I thought. Well, I, I had a good friend in the northern part of North Dakota who was a no-tailer. And he said, Gabe, you need to go no-till in order to save time and moisture. And that just made sense to me. Now, being a new farmer starting out, I couldn't afford to buy a no-till drill. So I sold all my tillage equipment and I bought a no-till drill, and we've been 100% zero-till ever since. Well, I found out quickly that it was a real good thing my father-in-law loved his daughter, because that was very, very hard for him to see those first no-till crops. And what I started with was, at that time, I thought it was pretty good soil. It was a Williams loam soil, but it was very, very destroyed from all the tillage. Many of you here know Jay Fear, the state soil health specialist with NRCS in North Dakota. And Jay came out to our ranch the first year I went no-till and he did some baseline soils. <laughs> and he found that we could only infiltrate half of an inch of rainfall per hour because of all the heavy tillage. That's all we could infiltrate. Now, we don't get a lot of rain in central North Dakota, certainly not like you get here, but we'll get 10 to 12 inches of rainfall a year. Then we get another four to five inches snow. Now the other thing Jay found by taking soil tests is organic matter levels were from 1.7 to 1.9 percent. Now historically speaking soil scientists say we should have been in the 7 to 8 percent range. That's what it was per European settlement. So in other words our management or as I like to call it stewardship we had lost 75 percent of the carbon in our soil. Well then the first year I went no-till, we had a 50 plus bushel spring wheat crop, which was very good for the time. And I thought, boy, this is easy. I know how to farm, okay? <laughs> but God had another plan for me. In 1995, the day before I was gonna start combining 1,200 acres of spring wheat, we lost 100% of our crop to hail. And I had no crop insurance on it. That's pretty tough to swallow for a young family starting out. So my wife and I took off farm jobs to help make payments. 1996 came along and I started to diversify a little bit. I added peas to the rotation because bank, although they loaned me an operating note again, they were, they were a lot, uh, should I say, less enthused than they were the year before. So I put some peas in, we were able to combine them, but before I could combine the rest of the small grains, we lost 100% of our crop to hail again. Well, that was really tough to swallow and really hard to go through. But think of what was happening. God had a plan for me. Think of the five principles of soil health, or as we're gonna talk about, we've added a sixth since then. So for those of you who got my book, it's already outdated, you'll have to get a new, new version. But uh, anyway, I had went no-till, so least amount of disturbance, but then due to two years of hail, I had the skin, the armor, the protection on that soil surface. 
1997 came along and we dried up. Nobody combined an acre in the air. So that was three years of natural disaster, three years no crop income. Well, I started to diversify and I, the bank wasn't going to loan me any more money for inputs. So I had to figure out how am I going to make this soil productive. So I actually went, I'm going to age myself now, but you know, do it, does anybody remember the Dewey Decimal System at the library? I had to go use the Dewey Decimal System, look up Thomas Jefferson's old journals. How did he do things on his plantation when there wasn't these commercial synthetics available? And so he was planting radishes and turnips and vetch, and I'm going, I can do that. I remember the first time that year I walked into the local co-op and I said, I need 50 pounds of turnips. Well, they were trying to figure out how many of those little bags it'd take to make 50 pounds, you know? It just, there wasn't any cover crop being sold back then. So I started to plant these cover crops. Then 1998 rolls around. The hailstorm in 1998 comes even earlier in June. So we had our third year of hail, fourth year of no crop, but God had a plan for me. Okay, I needed feed for my livestock. So I went and seeded sorghum sedan grass, and cowpeas. And as the story goes, this is true. I literally did not have the money to buy twine to bale after feed. So I turned the cattle in in the winter to graze that. What's one of the principles? Living root in the soil as long as possible, livestock animal integration, right? God had a plan for me. I tell people today that those four years were the hardest thing. I would not want anyone to have to go through that. But it was absolutely the best thing that could have happened to me. It was because of that then that I really started to understand the plan God had for me. We noticed earthworms coming onto our farm. I tell people, I went 12 years without ever going fishing because you'd never find an earthworm on the farm. Now every spade full of soil we see plenty of earthworms. It also gave me the opportunity to meet many, many good people. People like Grant and Don, people like Ray, and all, all those that I've met wherever I travel. And it's people coming together that really make a difference. If you would have told me years ago that I'd be standing here in front of the Minnesota Soil Health Coalition, I would have laughed. All I've ever wanted to do is move cattle and watch a chicken. I enjoy watching chickens. That's all I've ever wanted to do. But God has another plan. Now today we see businesses, and Tom Ramey from General Mills is here. We see companies coming together wanting to make a real difference and move regenerative ag forward for all farmers and ranchers. They understand that their future depends on our future. And what a fitting saying that was, Ray, that was given to Grant and Don, hope for a future. You know, we had, the, we had our Soil Health Academy here for the past three days, and we were standing out in the pasture down here, and Grant made a statement, and I don't even think he thought about it, but someone asked him what this means to him, and he said, it's peace of mind. And the thing is, we have the opportunity to visit with thousands of farmers and ranchers all over. And I tell you, right now it's not good in production agriculture. But things are good in regenerative agriculture. Ray and I get contacted all the time by media and uh, outlets and newspapers, uh, TV stations, and they, wanna, they want us to address an issue. Now that issue may vary. It may be climate change and global warming. And I tell them regenerative ag is the one thing that's out there that has the ability to take mega amounts of carbon out of the atmosphere and put it back into the soil, into the cycle where it belongs. Others call us and, and they talk about, oh, let's talk about all the nitrates and the phosphorus that's in our watersheds and the destruction of, of the watersheds. I tell them regenerative ag is the one thing that has the ability to take those nutrients and put them into the organic forms in living plants and biology and keep them on the soil 
to fuel profit for the farmers and ranchers. And then we have another fraction that comes to us and says, what about the human health crisis we're having in this country? And we do have a human health crisis in this country. The United States spends more on health care than any other country in the world, yet we're the 42nd healthiest country in the world. We're first in cases of ADD, ADHD, Parkinson's, Alzheimer, cancer, autoimmune diseases, osteoporosis, and the list goes on. Now, why is that? It's because of the lack of nutrient density in our food. Regenerative agriculture is the one thing that has the ability to put that nutrient density back into the foods we eat, and we can truly change human health with that. So with that, it's very, very exciting today to be here and to see you taking the initiative to make a difference in all facets of both our lives as farmers and ranchers, businesses, and in our communities. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Ray. Okay. Well, Tony, I, I like the way Tony started off. You know, the people, the more sustainable got really worn out. And so, I love the term regenerative because if I asked Jerry, I said, Jerry, how's your marriage? Jerry's right there, Jerry and I know. And his wife says, well, it's sustainable. <laughs> Boy, Jerry, it sucks to be you. <laughs> but if I go back and ask his lovely wife, how's being married to Jerry? Oh, it's regenerative. <laughs> Every day I look at him, my gosh, it's awesome. My, it gets better. It's growing. It's dynamic. It's alive. You see the difference? You can't sustain until you regenerate it. We're in a hole. I don't want us to stay in a hole. So how in the world did we get this whole movement going? Okay, so then uh, I got to meet Gabe, and it started for me in 2007. There was a group of guys, a group of us that said, hey, I can remember the first time I took this to my supervisor. She looked at me like, what is wrong with you? I can see why nobody wants to supervise you. Such a disturbed, a disturbed person. They probably looked at me like, that's a tilled field. And I said, and I said, I told her, this is it. She goes, what? It's about the biology. How are we going to communicate to people about the life in the soil? How can I instantaneously connect with them very quickly about this living organism that Troy said? You know what we came up with? The slake test. You see, the slake test was done for many years. Come here, honey, Gabe. Please. Yeah. Brad, you come and hold this. Stand over here, guys. Come, you hold it, Gabe, and, and I'll drop the clods in. <laughs> we came up with this by about 2008, 2009. Slaking has been around the term in the soil science for a long time long time. Slake is talking about how the soil breaks up in chunks. What happens is you get this dry soil and you put it in there. Each of these clods have millions and millions of pores. Like these beautiful underground caverns made with chocolate aggregates. I call them, I call it cottage cheese. They're fused together by life and biology. It is plants, fungi, bacteria, that create a majority of our structure. It's life that does that, ladies and gentlemen. And how can I communicate with a group of farmers that you, they've never seen you before, and how can we grab their attention? Because I'm gonna tell you, they're a tough crowd. Humans are hard to teach. They got years and years of filters. But you don't understand, Ray, we do it this way because my dad taught me. You don't understand, Ray. It's cold here. It's Minnesota. It's different. Oh, I forget. There's no biology in Minnesota. This is Mars. <laughs> we have taught in our schools to do great delineation. But we don't sit back and say, 
what's in common in the whole globe. Every soil, ladies and gentlemen, has microbes. Every soil on the planet. It's about biology. So how do we do it? This test, this is how it works. And I'll never forget the first time I did this. My knees were shaking. This was at Penn State. I had my little j uh, jar containers, yarn containers, the little holes, and I had my little tubes. And you don't understand how much flack I took with my peers. There goes Ray in his little jars. Such a disturbed boy. <laughs> Here's what, bothered, what was concerning. I went at the university. Everybody uses PowerPoints to teach. Do they not? I came with my little tubes. And I shook. And I was trembling when I first did this. So here's how it worked. I'm just going to run a scenario. And I'll never forget what happened that day. We're going to do it today. What we do is you're going to get, this is, this is Grant soil. No-till covers for how long? At least nine years. Nine years. This is conventional soil, tilled, beat up, and, and disturbed. Do you notice the reason why I gave it to Gabe? <laughs> Heavily disturbed. No, I mean the soil. He goes, we do this to each other all the time. He's going to get me later. Right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And so, you got to set the, look, now look at the colors of those soils right away, just to look at the difference. Till, disturbed, low disturbance ecosystem. These are very similar soils, ladies and gentlemen. So what I did is I said, look, I tell producers, and I'll guide you, we're going to drop these claws, these pads, so we'll sense them, say, you're going to drop them into the water. They're air dry. And I tell producers, I want you to do this on your operation. It is one indicator of health. It's only one. Please understand, when you go to the doctor, you are complex. That's why the doctor does a fecal test, a blood test, a saliva test, urine test, scan. Why? You are a complex ecosystem within your own right. You can't use one indicator to determine health. It's impossible. So it's the same way. It's a dynamic living ecosystem. But this one is the most visual and powerful. And the rain simulator. I'm going to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, these demonstrations. Do you know why we're here today? Not the most eloquent speaker could have been here. We're here because the soil spoke. It spoke itself. And it did it through these demonstrations and the one that Holly's going to do. It spoke. It is the most articulate. Let me show you how it works. We're going to drop those clouds into the water. A good, healthy soil will not fall apart. It has structure. It has the biotic super glues that hold it together. So when the water fills the pore space, it should hold the integrity. The pores should not fall up, uh, fall apart. If the fall, if the pores fall apart, porosity collapses. No porosity, no infiltration. Let's watch what happens. close to each other. Look what happens right away. And farmers are going, what? I remember I grabbed somebody from an audience of 300. It was a conventional producer. He did all the demos. Afterwards, he was, I went to the bar, have a cold beer, see that distraught farmer, and I said, oh no, did I hurt your feelings? He goes, no, you don't understand, Ray. I'm a conventional farmer. It emotionally got him. I had another producer in Illinois. He saw these two demonstrations you're going to see today. He converted 30,000 acres from conventional, Mark Ensign, to no-till and covers. One demonstration. No government program could have done that. It was the articulate soil. See, ladies and gentlemen, see these soils now, guess what? It can hold nutrients now. It doesn't leak them. 
The majority of the nitrogen in this type of soil is organic based nitrogen. It's not leaky. It holds CO2 more. With cover crops, the pH goes up. See, nature is self-healing, self-organizing, self-regulating. The moment you put those living covers, it starts that self-healing, self-organizing, self-regulating mechanism. Guess what? You do that every day. The moment you don't self-heal, self-organize, self-regulate, you know what that's called? Disease, cancer, death. And what does your body want? Let thy food be thy medicine. It wants nutrient-rich food. It will heal itself. The most powerful thing in the human body is the immune system. You gotta feed it food. The most powerful thing for this soil is the living cover. Biodiverse cover crops that mimic the forest and the prairie. Then the self-healing, self-organizing, self-regulating mechanisms. You see this soil? It's leaky, leaks nutrients, always dependent on fertilizer and pesticide. This soil, farmers, I call it, go through this vortex called death by tools. Going broke with your tractor and your equipment. Going broke with your pesticides and your fertilizers and chemicals. Death by tools that are destroying communities, that are relocating the wealth to the corporate world, but it should be at the local home. It all started with the soil. The soil is degraded. Why do we have climatic issues? The soil is diminished. Please understand that 40% of our rain comes from inland, from soils and plants respiring. We have a diminished water cycle. The land is bare, it's naked, it's hungry, it's running a fever. It is happening globally, not in our only in our crop, but our rangeland. You drive, I grew up in New Mexico. It hurts to go through Texas and New Mexico because that used to be a prairie that was covered. Every square inch was covered with a living prairie grass. Now it is a desert and becoming desertified. And that hot soil is heating and pushing the rain clouds away. The land is hurting. It's not just our country, but it's global. Man, you said, we're going to change it here. I'm saying we're going to change the world. We're going to heal the world. It's not good enough to heal here. All of it. So, at the end, that slake demo is powerful because you're going to see, you see those tiny particulates right here? Those are sands and clays, microscopic. You can't see them, the clays, you have to use an electron microscope. Do you know why the soils run off? Because they get plugged up because the clays plug them up and the silts. We don't have a runoff problem. We have an infiltration problem. We have a soil function problem. This is the problem, ladies and gentlemen, why we are going broke as a people. We can no longer afford this. And it's changing. This is the exciting part. Now, Gabe, you know, they told us they had, we had more time than we thought, but I know we're not gonna worry. It's always better to keep it short and pithy. <coughs> But folks, I'm going to I'm going to say my last part again. You want to wrap it up, folks? Most of us see. I grew up where we grew up in the West. Gabe and I have something very in common. I didn't grow up farming either. I grew up in town. I knew since 15 years old, bucking bales at my uncle's ranch, I was going to go get an education in agriculture. Recently, I just bought a farm at 55 years old. I wanted to be part of you. Since the beginning, I had a small farm in Idaho, but I needed to feel your pain. I needed to be right there with you. And I remember signing the papers with the farm. I rolled over and looked at my wife. I said, I must be an idiot. I could have just used my pension, paid my house cash, live there. No, I bought a farm. 
because I love it. It's part of our lives. That's why we're all here. We love what we do. So here's the journey that we went. And Gabe will explain that. And I'll throw that last pen up there, Gabe. You know? yeah, go, ahead. Oh, go ahead and explain it. Okay. All of us started right here. A majority of all of us started here. And I love what Gabe says. Even his soil is degraded. I don't even know what a really healthy soil would look like. Would you, Gabe? One. We haven't seen one. We see healthier soils, but can you imagine four to five hundred years ago what this looked like? But we do have some indications. Look at Grant's. Look at their soils. Grant's and Don's. Look how the transition. They went from here with seven years of covers, right? You can still see the covers. Look at the beautiful cottage cheese. We talk about the aggregation. Look at the pasture. So go from here in the pastures because most pasture systems usually, usually are healthier than most conventional because they have all the principles usually. Living root, cover, skin, the animal integration, but yet some of our pastures are in such bad shape they're all overgrazed. A majority of our country is overgrazed. Okay? And the and when you do a rain simulator and hay fields and pastures that are overgrazed run off more water for just as much as a conventionally tilled field. And then the last one is nature herself. You wanna hold, Gabe, you wanna flip this over for me? This is a forest soil. Forest soils, just flip it right here. Forest soils will infiltrate over 50 inches per hour. So if you can flip it now, I want you guys, when you have time before, I want you to come and I want you to see all that white material. That is saprophytic fungi doing this. They're doing this. It's life, ladies and gentlemen. The soil is not a growing medium. It's just magic. It just holds up the ground. It is a life. It is the microbes that do 98% of our nutrient cycling. Why are forest soils so incredible healthy? They obey all the principles. And notice what Gabe told you. He did not obey all the principles right away. It was a journey. And all the producers that integrate all of them, they have freedom and they have a quality of life. So, Gabe, you want to wrap it up? Thank you, Ray. So I mentioned that we added a sixth principle, and that sixth principle is context, because we really think it's important that we farm, we ranch, we operate our businesses in context. That context is going to be different wherever you're located. You're not going to do the same things here in Minnesota that I do in North Dakota, but the principles are the same. You have to put it into your content. Now, I want to finish my story because it's a story we see played out over and over again who go down for, from people who go down this regenerative path. At the end of those four years of hail and drought, I was $1.5 million in debt. I didn't know how I'd crawl out of that hole, but God showed me the way because what happened then was every year it got better and better as I applied the principles and learned to work with them in my context it became more and more profitable Ray and I are part of a business called understanding ag and part of that business is we consult <coughs> on farms and ranches all over North America we started that business two years ago in July it was just two years we're now on over 10 million acres across North America. That's how fast regenerative ag is growing. And I'll just tell you a couple stories. I'm not going to give the names of our clients, uh, the, the last names, but just as an example, one of our clients, Adam in North Carolina, Adam started working with us right after we formed a business two years ago. The second year, he just finished his second year of applying these regenerative practices. 
he saved $187,000. Adam no longer needs to take <coughs> operating notes. We started working with a client in northern Alberta. His operating note, just for his inputs, was over $1.5 million. It's now down to $127,000. He paid cash for 10,000 acres of land with the money he saved. That's what regenerative ag can do. It can restore hope, it can restore profitability, it can take care of these climate issues, it can take care of our watershed, it can take care of the nutrient density in our food, and it can restore profitability into farms and ranches. Now the one thing I'm happy to say on, on my own farm or ranch, we dug out of that million five hundred thousand dollar hole that I put us in. And because of that, we were able to bring the next generation onto our ranch. Not only that, we've already turned the ranch over to our son. And he's going to take this way beyond where any place I dreamt it to be. He's going to take it much further, and he's going to advance soils much further. I told you how we started. We could only infiltrate a half of an inch of rainfall per hour. I now have the good fortune, I have scientists coming from around the world to look at our farm and ranch. We can now, on those same soils that could only infiltrate a half of an inch per hour, we can now infiltrate an inch in nine seconds and the second inch in 16 seconds. We can infiltrate well over 30 inches per hour. The same soils that were 1.7 to 1.9 percent organic matter are now from 5.3 to 7.9 percent organic matter. But as Ray said, we're still degraded. My son at a, at a conference he spoke at made the statement in his lifetime, he believes he will get all of our soils over 12% organic matter. And I believe he's gonna do it, and he's gonna do it much, much faster than we used to think possible. That's where the future of regenerative agriculture is. The Minnesota he Soil Health Coalition is the start of that. There's many farmers and ranchers here that are doing great things in Minnesota, and they're going to take this above and beyond what Ray and I have done. And I know that there's good things in store. The businesses that are involved, the organizations, the agencies, will all take this much, much further. So with that, I'm going to end with two things. I want to know if there's anyone here who is farming and ranching and was, was not uh, born into it. I'll put it that way. Anyone farming and ranching that was not, here's a lady right here. Here you go. This is for you. Oh, this, we already have that. Yes. <laughs> That's all right. Then I'm going to ask you to give it to somebody. Yeah, I'm also a librarian, so it's going to my library. There. Great. Right. Great. Right. Ne next question. The next thing I will do is I'm just going to donate this other signed copy to the Minnesota Soil Health Coalition, and they can do with it as they see fit. So on behalf of Ray and myself, I want to thank you and, and encourage you to be active in this organization. I also want to thank, say thank you once again to Grant and Don and Carly and Cody for being such gracious hosts. Thank you.